for having me. And, um, you know, we've had lots of these meetings and they've all been dedicated to certain topics. And um, today I'm mostly going to talk about my experience in acetabular surgery and proximal humerus fractures. Um, please feel free to interrupt me, ask questions, give me feedback. I think this this product is very new. We're all learning, and um, you know I'm still learning. So there there are certainly things I do wrong, um, but I think there's lots of opportunity um, to have good outcomes with this product. Um, this is my case log. Uh, I started about almost two years ago. Um, and my first case was a distal femur fracture. But certainly right now, the most common injuries I'm using it for are the anterior pelvis, superior ramus fractures, uh, acetabulum fractures, proximal humerus and distal radius fractures in elderly. So I'm going to start off with a case. This is um, a 80 some odd year old gentleman who fell down, has this periprosthetic uh, acetabulum fracture. And um, this is a tough situation. And my partner calls me and asks for help. And so how can we salvage this problem? And, um, you know, I think this is a good indication for, you know, removing the current implants, repairing the acetabulum, and then uh, providing stability. It could be with traditional implant screws, uh, but also implants. And there are some advantages that we'll get into with Illuminos in a, in a few minutes. Um, when I look at this, I think the standard algorithm is going to be, be remove these implants. Do we need to talk about, talk about. um, operative versus non-operative right. management? Um, do we let it heal on its own and come back later? And do we need to do an acute revision versus a delayed revision? Do we use conventional implants on that delayed revision or a cup cage construct or a tri flange? So we'll get into this case a little bit more detail. It's an 83-year-old man, a history of prostate cancer, diagnosed in 2020, had radiation and hormone therapy, no, no surgery or prostatectomy, was doing pretty well until he started having groin pain. This is about a year ago. These are his MRI images. And what we can see is uh, we have lesions in both the posterior and anterior column, um, basically an impending pathologic fracture. Um, and my, my question now, and, and I'm, I'm really looking to any oncology people in this, this, uh, on the call, is that it seems like this is a pretty darn good indication right now for Illuminos. I know some of these are radiosensitive, um, but just like a humerus fracture that's painful or a femur fracture that's painful, this is a good indication. Is there anyone that can speak to their experience in this situation? Hi, um, Santiago Lozano here from Mass General Orthopedic Oncology. Um, so I have, I have been using it for two years for pathologic fractures and impending pathologic fractures of the pelvis, and I think it, it works very good. This is a great indication. It works better when you have um, more like lytic lesions and multiple lesions. Uh, sometimes with the blastic lesions, it's harder to do the rimming in the pathways. Mm -hmm. um, but there are ways to go around that because I still think it's better than a, than a screw. You can get a larger diameter implant and you can cover more of the length of the column. And uh, if the patient gets better and you need to do on top a uh, total hip arthroplasty, uh, it works really well, and I have used it probably like in 12 or 15 patients in a combo in which I reconstruct both columns, the sciatic corridor, and do on top a total, a total hip. So to me, it's a great indication, and also the fact that it's very lucid. So for follow-up later on with CTs and MRIs, which is important for us, uh, works great. Thank you, Santiago. I mean, you, you're like prophetic in following this case already. Um, so yeah, he's got these metastatic lesions around the acetabulum. He, he, he was evaluated a couple months later by our oncologist and they recommended radiation. Um, 
and follow up in a couple of months. And he did follow through with this, but unfortunately, two months later, he started having increasing hip pain. You can see that at this point, what was impending is now um, a real, uh, pretty much non-displaced, slightly impacted acetabulum fracture. And again, I think right here is a great opportunity uh, to do aluminos. And like uh, Dr. Lozano said, that maybe we stabilize his fracture, maybe he does well. Um, it, it is possible that he could go on and still require total hip arthroplasty on top of that, but uh, potentially not. Um, at this point, I, I really wasn't involved in the case this time, and he underwent uh, total hip arthroplasty in September. Uh, so that's a that's a month later. Uh, the reamings were sent, which were negative for tumor. Um, and then he was mostly non-weight bearing, but fell down a month later and has what you can see is progression of this acetabulum fracture. Unfortunately, we decided to uh, observe this. And then um, he is getting worsening displacement of his acetabular cup. And he's still requiring narcotics. And we continue to observe it. And three months later, which is now in late December, early January, um, has even worsening. So now there's protrusio of the cup medially. It's also superiorly displaced. Now we're getting back to this 3D rendering that we looked at at the beginning. And what are our options? And um, this is uh, fairly acute, but, but still... Um, you know, pathologic, and I don't know how it's going to respond to, you know, previously irradiated area. Uh, but our plan at this point was to stabilize his acetabulum with percutaneous fixation um, and potentially supplement with plate fixation as well uh, to create stable columns for a revision total hip arthroplasty. So that's what we did. We, we removed the implants a couple days later. Uh, came back for an anti-grade anterior column technique. I'll just flip through these slides. And we'll, if anyone has questions about the technique itself, uh, we can discuss that in the future. Um, insert the balloon into anterior column and then do an anti-grade. I had a, a lateral window open, so I did an anti-grade anterior column. Sorry, excuse me, anti-grade posterior column uh, balloon. And so stabilize the column. I also put an intrapelvic plate because he had a really comminuted uh, quadrilateral surface that even though the columns were stable, I wanted to push that quadrilateral surface bone laterally and create it as stable construct as possible. And a couple of days later after that, he underwent revision. This was by report, you know, a fairly uh, conventional revision, not loose bone, um, immediate weight bearing. And this is four months later. He's walking 200 feet um, with minimal to no pain. And certainly in this video, he's not running marathons or anything like that. But he is, uh, he hadn't been walking for a year. So I say this is pretty darn good. Um, so I, I, in this case, I think it's a fantastic outcome. Um, this is a case I presented, similar patient younger in this search in this situation that had um, multiple revisions for instability um, she's in her 50s uh, my partner did this acetabular revision really anniverted the cup well but unfortunately she had a domestic violence uh, situation which her husband pushed her down now the cup really protruded uh, through the acetabulum particularly the anterior column um, this is her ct scan and Really, there's no anterior column. Um, and so at this point, we're deciding, hey, what should we do? Should we just do a cup cage? Should we do a triflange? Um, but the problem with those things, and any arthroplasty person on the call can please interrupt me and tell me differently, is that the longevity of those things are, are not as durable as conventional implants. And so we try to do what we could to put conventional implants in. So our plan was to reconstruct the anterior column with an aluminous balloon and then put revision implants in. This is after the implant was removed. Um, I did do an intrapelvic plating. Um, this is a striker plate with a quadrilateral buttress, um, docked it posteriorly, and then placed a retrograde uh, aluminous balloon, if you can see it, uh, going into the supraacetabular bone. 
Um, it's a little bit more blown up in which you can see the coils underneath the plate or post-operative images. And then here's a CT scan. I'll try to highlight the balloon. If you see my cursor, when we get to that super acetabular bone, which is starting about here and going into the superior ramus. And then this is our uh, revision surgery. The head of the patient's at the top, the legs are at the bottom, um, the posterior wall is left, the anterior column is right. This is the balloon in the cup. This is after we've really shaped the acetabulum and the balloon. You can see that it's been reined into, but still providing stability. And we bone grafted, and then he underwent a revision total hip um, and doing uh, reasonably well. Actually, the only unfortunate thing is they developed SI joint arthritis that was severe and had to have an SI joint fusion. You know, when you have lumbar fusions next to this, a lot of motion just going through the SI joint. Lastly, is the most uh, recent patient I've done is a 74-year-old woman with metastatic lung cancer on chemo. Um, really, I think that's kind of a, uh, not involved. This is long-standing AVN, not related to her chemo. Uh, this is really a tr just a traumatic fall and has a minimally displaced uh, right acetabulum fracture adjacent uh, to the uh, hip AVN. Um, here's a CT scan. This patient really can't get out of bed due to pain. Um, and so the options now are, do we try to treat her non-operatively and just let this heal on its own? That's reasonable, but she can't move. Um, do we try to just treat her acetabulum with screws or balloons or whatever, uh, improve that pain? Well, yes, we solved that problem, but we still have hip ABM that's symptomatic, or do we just go for it? And that was our plan. We're going to go for it. Um, so here, uh, we do a retrograde anterior column balloon. Placing in kind of traditional fashion for uh, retrograde anterior column screws. I left uh, the wire in because I didn't know if I'd ever, my drill would ever get close to a balloon. I didn't want to pop the balloon, so to speak. And I tried to hang conscious in it with this uh, anagrade posterior column technique down the gluteal pillar, but I'm just technically not that good. So it didn't really work for me. Um, so I went to my traditional old fashioned retrograde kind of butt screw if you'd if you'd say um going up the posterior column reaming up to get a bigger size and then put in anterior and posterior column balloons has created a stable stable construct for the acetabulum to be reconstructed with total hip and this was a primary total hip from my uh, arthroplasty partner it was not unstable at all and this patient's probably about two months out now doing well so I'd say acetabular pearls are restore the, the stable columns. If they're minimally displaced, like most of these situations, you don't really have to do much of a reduction. But if they're displaced, you do have to do a reduction. Create stable columns. Then you can build to that with your uh, total hip arthroplasty or revision arthroplasty. The advantage of this over screws is that it can be reamed, particularly in the anterior column. Uh, oftentimes, our colleagues reaming the cuffs will run into those anterior column screws. It avoids custom implants that are uh, take time to order because they're all uh, mapped off uh, CTs and, and uh, uh, 3D printed, basically, and they're expensive. And it allows a more durable implant that accepts ingrowth. So that was our plan. Is uh, At this point, I'm, I'm going to go on to humerus stuff in the, for me to treat proximal humerus fractures. Um, I'm going to go to, this is one of the first patients I did um, she had, she's 77, she's healthy, she's independent. She had a left proximal humerus fracture was pretty, pretty mega varus alignment, an olecranon fracture. And I told her, you know, she's healthy, we're going to fix your olecranon fracture. Some people would say, hey, treat this proximal humerus non-operatively, but she's healthy. I want to maximize her potential for overhead range of motion. So therefore I opted her. I recommended that she have surgery to optimize her alignment. It's a 3D rendering of her proximal humerus fracture. And this is, we're going to go by this step by step. This is a percutaneous technique of just placing joysticks into the proximal humerus and restoring more valgus alignment using a ball stick or a, a ball spike pusher to push the shaft over, then putting provisional fixation in. 
You do have to be careful when you put the provisional fixation that you don't pierce any balloons, but for the most part, the balloons that we're inserting are going past the smooth portions of the wires. Um, I did do a trans cuff approach for this, made a nice incision in the cuff, uh, basically center, center start point, drop the guide wire down, followed by the sheath and the balloon, and then uh, insufflated the monomer into the balloon. And what we can see when I go back and forth between these x-rays or fluoro shots is that just increasing the monomer amounts distracts or helps improve the alignment actually. Uh, you do have to be careful that if you continue to put the monomer in the balloon, it can over distract the fracture, uh, which is not great. Um, and ultimately I did supplement this fixation with some uh, percutaneously inserted screws. This is post-operatively and then at six weeks. Um, and this is our six week follow-up. Certainly this isn't every patient with this injury, but for six weeks, proximal humerus fracture, I think this is fantastic. Um, but uh, in my experience, and I, I have had some failures, um, particularly with this percutaneous technique, I do think there's a learning curve for this device that's new to us. We, we don't all know how it responds in certain situations yet. And you have to be aware of collapse or subsidence. Uh, such as in this uh, patient where the balloon or the fracture subsided, the humeral head subsided and the balloon stuck out uh, through the articular surface. Uh, this did require me to go back and burr that down. Um, and after that, she did well, but it was a secondary surgery. Um, similar situation in which uh, there was some fracture subsidence uh, and the screws penetrated the joint, went back and removed those screws and she did well. Um, and, you know, that can even happen with your traditional plate fixation as well. And remember, going back to don't over distract joints or fractures, as you say. And this is one patient I did that I think I underestimated the amount of instability at her fracture. Did it in a percutaneous technique. Um, and I think it was just too unstable a fracture and should have been supplemented with plate fixation. So I, at this point, and I'd love to hear back from anyone doing this, is that I, I think there's some fractures, I don't know exactly which ones, that need more fixation than this because this ultimately went on and broke and we took it out and uh, had to revise her to a reverse total shoulder. I and mean, she did okay, but certainly we, we would love to have this done in one surgery for her. So kind of some takeaway technical pearls on this percutaneous technique or anticipate. Please learn from those of us that have made mistakes, anticipate these common failures bury the balloon below the articular surface, supplement with screw fixation or even plate fixation. So I'm gonna go on to some cases, that's, that's supplementing with screws there. I'm gonna go on to cases, this is really how I do it now for proximal humerus fractures. Um, a lot of these are, are geriatric, varus displaced fractures, really gonna have limited overhead range of motion if they're left uh, in, this, uh, in this alignment. This one has sort of a minimally displaced greater tuberosity component. Because of that tuberosity component, I did want to do this open. Um, I used an elevator to elevate the head out of varus alignment, put in provisional fixation, and did a retrograde um, balloon insertion technique. This is basically like putting a fibular strut in, except I don't have to displace the fracture to put the strut in. I don't have to go back and forth and whittle it down until it's in the right spot. Um, and really simple to do, insert the balloon and then um, maximally insufflate it until I like its position, hypervalgus with displaced greater tuberosity fracture that it elevated, and then uh, use the aluminos to be my fibular strut laterally and blew it up as you see in the right image to prevent the head from subsiding into valgus and then supplementing with plate fixation. And so my pearls in the proximal humerus fracture is certainly percutaneous uh, technique is, is viable. Um, I do think you need to anticipate these common failures and fracture collapse. You may need to bury the balloon, just not at the articular surface, but below it. And you need, you need to consider supplementing with fixation. And honestly, I, I would love to have a breakout session on people's successes and failures with this technique because uh, I think we need to identify which injuries are, are good for this and which ones are not and really need traditional uh, plate fixation. And the open reduction, which I do more commonly now, 
this device basically supple, uh, uh, excuse me, is the um, alternative to a fibular strut. To me, much easier to insert, much easier. Um, you don't really have to displace the fracture to put it in. Uh, you do it in one time. You don't have to keep whittling the fibula down. And for these val, uh, excuse me, these varus collapse injuries, um, particularly when there's displaced two Rossi's, I know it's going to be open. Um, I do this in retrograde fashion so I can reduce my uh, tuberosities approximately. And if it's not, if it's really just a two part, I still think you can do an integrate uh, uh, technique. And once you have a center center um, uh, starting point, when you do do that, honestly, the balloon does a lot of the reduction of itself. Um, and then if you have a valgus displacement, remember, just put that balloon where you put your fibula, place it laterally in an integrated fashion. Um, and it really acts as a strut to help uh, uh, prevent uh, fracture subsidence or displacement. And that's the end of my talk. I'm happy to take any questions, comments.